Okay, Maharaj. I will keep it posted for you, for sure. I just guessed. I, I wasn't sure what it was. I was trying to figure out what the, what the, what it was. But okay. I'm sorry, Maharaj. If there was some inconvenience, kindly excuse me for that. Okay. So, let me see. Where are we? No, I haven't. I may have to log off again because PowerPoint. I've got to enter. I have to leave for a minute and get the PowerPoint opened. Oh, there it is. Recording in progress. Okay, so here we are. So I'll share the screen. You have to make me a host. Okay. Okay. Om Jnana Timarandasya Jnana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swami Nitinamane Namaste Sarasati Devi Koravani Precharine Nervise Shashanyavari Paschacha Dejatarine Vancha Kaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bayevacha Patita Nam Pavan Ebyo Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar, Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama, Rama Hare Hare So we're continuing our study of the Srimad Bhagavatam for the Bhakti Vaibhav and we're on Canto 2, Chapter Number 4 which is entitled The Process of Creation. Maybe we could just review something. What do you remember from Chapter 3? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, yeah. Now, the first is the, uh, the, uh, the connection between the second chapter, second and the third one. Sugadeva Sir Goswami concluded his answer to Parishit Maharaj regarding the duty of a man who is about to die. That is, the person should take to Krishna Katha. The person should hear Krishna Katha. And then, what, then he asked about what about the people who have material desire? That is, one may, uh, to that he answers that one may worship demigods, that may be uh, for Lakshmi for wealth, or goddesses Saraswati for learning, Ashwini Kumara for long life, uh, Ganesha to overcome problems, etc. Et uh, then, only by worship of Narayana. The Lakshmi will reside there. Otherwise, she is Chanchala. She will not remain there uh, forever or for a long time. So then another question asked immediately is, how to develop broader intelligence? So we have to have to worship Supreme Lord and not Demigod. That means if we worship uh, Demigod, it is temporary. So we have to take, take shelter of the uh, devotees. And then we talked about, the, then uh, there was a topic about the difference between Nitya Siddha and Sadhana Siddha. 
the liberated souls from birth are called nitya siddhas and sadhana siddhas are one who develop the tendency for developing devotional service by association and uh, association actually there is no difference uh, much difference between the two uh, in the ultimate sense in conclusion everyone can become sadhana siddha a devotee of the lord simply by associating with the pure devotees of the lord then again we saw that how maharaja parikshit and sukadev goswami both from the childhood they were devotees of the lord and uh, since both of them uh, were devotees they were able to bond each other very well and then uh, we talked about some the analogies of the examples which was given only a person like dogs camels hawks and asses praise those men who never listen to the transcendental pastimes of the lord so here the examples given are the hawks the hawks they eat anything uh, they, they eat anything anywhere and everywhere and then the camel they eat their own blood and think that they are enjoying and asses they are always kicked by everyone maybe it is a master or the female ass dogs accept service from the great masters and the modern education is the example which is of the doggish mentality uh, and then one who does not want to hear about the topic of the lord he is just like wearing a turban which is just a heavy burden that's it and they you know uh, and if they don't bow their head in front of the lord and then the eyes again other examples which are given are the eyes which do not look at the supreme lord is just like an eye of the peacock which doesn't have any vision legs which are not used to go to the temples uh, or the holy places is just like the uh, tree trunk so krishna also says that it is uh, uh, you know uh, krishna gives the uh, this one that uh, mercy to people to, to people who take shelter of his devotees rather than directly uh, to him uh, and then the exact this one here what was given was uh, the vrindavan everyone prays to shrimati radha rani she is very merciful and she recommends if she recommends to krishna then krishna immediately accepts it and in conclusion it was said that one's heart is just like a free steel that is in spite of chanting the holy names of the lord if the cha, if the heart does not change hari krishna so who was saying all of these things who was giving all of this examples and criticizing the non devotees this sudagama sudadeva swami is uh, is giving that this one to parikshit maharaj hari krishna maharaj yes uh, uh, in the beginning it was uh, uh, shila sudagama swami uh, sorry parikshit maharaj and then from uh, verse i think 13 then uh, shornakarishi starts describing about and criticizing for the rest of the chapter right shornakarishi right very powerful and he really puts a lot of life into the audience you know when he gets up and starts speaking everyone can feel you know <laughs> they feel alert <laughs> because he's really on the ball he and he really, really opens everyone's mind up to what's going on in the material world and the position of the materialists okay very good so we're going on now to chapter 4 the process of creation we'll just see the 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 structure of the chapter so it begins with maharaj parikshit accepting the instructions of sukadeva goswami and if he fixes his mind on krishna and because this was of course this was sukadeva goswami's instruction right that we should fix the mind on krishna so maharaj parikshit accepted that and then maharaj parikshit is going to inquire about shristi tatva he wants to know about the creation and he has questions to ask so we will hear his questions in 5 verses 5 up to 10 and then after being questioned like this then sukadeva goswami begins to reply and he begins his reply by offering prayers and the, these prayers are very nice also we'll look at these prayers actually there's a there's a recording of shrila prabhupad chanting these prayers I couldn't find it myself. I was looking for it, but I couldn't come across it. But it should be there somewhere. 
uh, where Srila Prabhupada recites, he's singing these verses of Sukadev Goswami's prayers from this uh, chapter 4. All right, so that's the overview. And then the connection with the previous chapter. So, in, inspired by Shona Karishi's eagerness, right, we heard this great eagerness, Sutta Goswami continues the narration. Maharaj Parikshit, the son of Uttara, after hearing the speeches of Srila Sukadeva Goswami, which were all about the truth of the Self, applied his concentration faithfully upon Lord Krishna. So that's text number one. Uh, he applied his concentration faithfully upon Lord Krishna. This is described for us also. There's some nice verses there where it's described how Sukadeva, how Maharaj Parikshit fixed his mind on Lord Krishna. In the in the tenth canto, there's a verse, first chapter fifteen, and then the second chapter, there's another verse, and the eighth chapter, two and three. They both describe how Maharaj Parikshit fixed his mind on Lord Krishna. All right, would somebody like to read the second verse for me? This is the first verse. We would like someone to read verse number two. Maharaj. Yes, please. Atma jaya sutha gara, pashodra vina pandusho, raje javika ve nityam, virudha mamatam jahau. Very good. Yeah, English? Translation, Maharaj? Yes. Maharaj Parikshit, as a result of his wholehearted attraction for Lord Krishna, was able to give up all deep-rooted affection for his personal body, his wife, his children, his palace, his animals like horses and elephants, his treasury house, his friends and relatives, and his undisputed kingdom. So we can understand how much Maharaj Parikshit was determined to be fixed on Lord Krishna, that he could give up all of those things to go to take shelter of Lord Krishna. Not, not, not an easy thing to do, you know, that you spend your whole life endeavouring and, and acquiring all of these things and certainly you develop affection for the family members and children and relatives. But he could give up everything and go off to take shelter of Krishna. So they say, you know, at the time of death, everything is revealed. We can, we can understand the heart of a person by his condition at the time of death. And we see from Maharaj Parikshit, what was his condition? How fixed he was to just simply fully surrender himself to Lord Krishna and go off and take guidance. All right, so can someone read text number three now? Yes, someone please read text three. Hare Krishna. Yanma 
O great sages, the great soul Maharaj Parikshit constantly wrapped in thought of Lord Krishna, knowing well of his imminent death, renounced all sorts of fruitive activities, namely acts of religion, economic development, and sense gratification, and thus fixed himself firmly in his natural love for Krishna, and asked all these questions exactly as you are asking me. Thank you, Krishna. So, Maharaj Parikshit has no material desire. He's not thinking about anything for his own self, for his own sense gratification. He simply wants to submit himself to the lotus feet of the devotees and to become more absorbed in Krishna. So we see from this, you know, the process of renunciation and the process of preparing ourselves for death how to get detached, you know, how, how do we get detached? We have to give up all of these things. Not so easy. Sometimes we tell that story, uh, it's maybe, it, it's actually a Buddhist story, but it's relevant in this regard, you know, there was a, there was a disciple, he was, he came to his guru and he was asking his guru, Guruji, how I can get detached, how I can let go of this material world. I have so many attachments. So the Guru said, okay, just wait, in a little while I will tell you. And so after some time, he heard his Guru calling out, help, help, let me go, let me go. So he came running, the disciple came running to see what was wrong with this spiritual teacher. And he saw a spiritual teacher was holding on to a tree and his arms were around the tree and he was yelling out, let me go, let me go. So the disciple said to the spiritual teacher, he said, Guruji, what's wrong? He said, I want to let go, I want to get free from this tree. So the disciple said to his teacher, but T Guruji, you just have to let go. You're holding on to the tree, you just have to let go. So then the teacher turned to the disciple and he looked at him in the face and he said, yes. He said, this is how you get detached. You just have to let go. Don't carry everything with you. So of course, you know, Buddhists, they want to give up everything, you know, their, their process is the process of negation. In Krishna consciousness, our process is to let go of the material to hold on to the spiritual. If we embrace fully the spiritual, then we won't be able to hold on to anything material. So this is the beauty of hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. When we hear the Srimad Bhagavatam, we become so absorbed in the Srimad Bhagavatam, we forget about everything material. We're so, we're so absorbed in thinking about Maharaj Parikshit and Sukadeva Goswami and all the other wonderful things which are narrated to us in the Srimad Bhagavatam. We're so absorbed in remembering the different slokas and the different philosophical arguments which are put, that we, we forget everything about the material world. Isn't it? Do you agree? Are you forgetting everything? At least, you know, when we come here for a few hours, every Saturday, every Friday and Saturday, you forget everything? Yes, yes, definitely. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. It's really blissful. Yes, definitely. We forget everything. I also, even I forget everything also myself, you know. <laughs> it's so wonderful. This is, so this is the sadhana, of course, we want to hear every day. We want to absorb ourselves and 
this and we want to hear the Srimad Bhagavatam. It, it's so nectarian. We cannot hold on to the material and at the same time hold on to the spiritual. That would be like having one foot in one boat, one foot in another boat. You're in for trouble. All right? So Maharaj Parikshit, he got detached from everything and he had a lot to be detached from, but he got detached by the mercy of the devotees like Sukadeva Goswami who absorbed his mind in topics of Krishna. All right? So I think that there's one more verse still to read. All right? We've read two. Yes, Maharaj. Yes? Rajo vacha samichi nam vacho brahman sarvagnyasya tavarnaka tamo vishiriti mahyam hare kathaita katham. Translation Yes. Maharaj Parikshit said, O learned Brahmana, you know everything because you are without material contamination. Therefore, whatever you have spoken to me appears perfectly right. Your speeches are gradually destroying the darkness of my ignorance, for you are narrating the topics of the Lord. Yes. So Maharaj Parikshit wants to hear more from Sukadev Goswami because he knows by hearing from Sukadev Goswami, he will get rid of all the ignorance. Of course, Maharaj Parikshit is actually already a very advanced devotee, but that's his humility. Out of humility, he is speaking like this. That he wants Sukadeva Goswami to purify his heart, and he's going to ask him to explain topics, and he particularly wants to hear about creation. Right. First of all, from the purport of the fifth chapter, Prabhupada writes. Yes, someone can read. Hare Krishna, when a hungry man is given food to eat, he feels satiation of hunger and the pleasure of dining simultaneously. Thus, he does not have to ask whether he has actually been fed or not. The crucial test of hearing Srimad Bhagavatam is that one should get positive enlightenment by such an act. Hare Krishna. Yes. Yes, it's a very nice example, which is given also in the Srimad Bhagavatam, right? That by taking food, we feel relief from hunger and satisfaction and strength and nourishment. It all comes about simultaneously as we eat food. And the same way, when we hear the Srimad Bhagavatam, then we will also get what Prabhupada has described here, positive enlightenment. It will bring about, in other words, it will bring about detachment from what is not in relation to Krishna consciousness. Detachment from everything material that will naturally come about by hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam. This is a test of hearing. So that we get detachment and we develop also more realization of our spiritual position and we get actual consciousness of Lord Krishna. So it all comes about by hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam. There, there, used, there was one man in Vrindavan, there was a temple in Vrindavan, it was called Pago Baba's temple. Pagla, Pago Baba's. <laughs> Pago, right? Pago means mad. <laughs> so this Pago Baba, he used to have a feast. The devotees told me, I, I don't know, I never had the experience. But the devotees told me, he used to invite everybody having a feast and he'd have a big, he told everybody to come to his temple and he'd have a feast. And he would, he would have a feast. And the, the, but the problem, after everybody took prasadam, everyone felt like they'd never had anything. <laughs> they were taking the prasadam, 
But afterwards they were still hungry, they never felt satisfied. It was like some kind of strange food which they would eat. They would never feel like they were eating anything. <laughs> I don't know. The, he was a, a yogi with some kind of power. He created food. It looked like food, but, <laughs> but when they ate it, it didn't satisfy their hunger. Of course, real food, you will feel that hunger, you will feel relief from hunger, and you will feel the nourishment. And the same way, when we actually hear Srimad Bhagavatam, if it's effective, we should feel enlightenment. And if we hear from people who are not actually devotees, who are not, who have some other motive, then it will, it will not have the same effect. And so Prabhupada warns us to be careful who we hear from. All right, so then the next session goes on. So Maharaj Pariksha is going to inquire about Shristi Tattva, right? So he has questions to ask. First of all, text number six. How does the Lord create the universes which are inconceivable even for the demigods? The demigods are in the higher planets, they're up in Swargaloka, but how the Lord actually creates the universe is beyond their powers of comprehension. So Maharaj Parikshit wants to hear about the creation. Prabhupada, of course, cautions us to be, that this is important. Actually, this subject matter of creation will be discussed uh, three, three times in the third canto. And it's discussed especially here in the second canto. This is one of the main topics of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And it's important for us to hear. We shouldn't want to just jump up to the rasalila and to the internal potency pastimes. The Shristi Tattva is concerned with the Lord's external potency. So first we have to understand how he creates and then we can be more qualified to understand his internal potency. Right. Why do you think it's important for us to first of all hear about creation? Yes, Prabhu. Yes, Prabhu. Anything related to Krishna, it's always glorified. Anything done by Lord Krishna is name, past times, data, everything is glorified. Well, if everything's glorified, why not just hear Rasa Leela then? Sorry, I can't hear you very well, Madhuji. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Uh, first, we, first we should know the greatness of the Lord, then we can uh, experience the sweetness of the Lord more material. Yes, we have to know about the greatness of the Lord. Yeah, so, how great is He? You know, there was, we used to have this, well, there was this one American boxer, he used to say, I am the greatest. <laughs> right? He was always saying, I am the greatest. And he would win, he would often win, he was a world champion in boxing and he was always saying, I'm the greatest. <laughs> so, how do we know the Lord Krishna is the greatest? Hare Krishna Maharaj, yeah. Hello, Pranam. Uh, actually, uh, through this Srishti Leela, we understand how Lord has created this uh, world, temporary world, just for the satisfaction of our misdirected desires and then so that we rectify it and then go back home, back to Godhead. So before we go to the higher topics, we have to understand where we are and how we are stuck here through the external energy of the Lord due to our misdirected desires. And that's why we should first hear this topic. Okay. So you're talking that maybe we need to purify ourselves before we hear about Krishna's confidential pastimes. 
Yes, yes, Maharaj. We should purify and then gradually go there. Uh, the same was also explained in uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, second, uh, first one, uh, first canto, second verse. Yes, you know the verse? Yes, Maharaj. Dharma projita kaita vatra paramu. Yes, right. Yes, and what's that dharma projita kaitava? Dharma kaitava? What Th is those? Yeah, those all are uh, materially motivated religion, which has been discussed in the previous chapters here also uh, by Srila Sukadeva Goswami one by one, and then he has rejected uh, saying that Krishna Gatha is the topmost. Uh huh. Okay. And especially in the last chapter, he has also mentioned that for materially motivated persons, how they are uh, doing different uh, demigod worship, which has been nicely narrated by Ravindra Prabhu also in the beginning of the class. Uh -huh. Yes. So, we want to also understand about Lord Krishna and his position. That he is possessing inconceivable potencies which mentioned here even the demigods cannot comprehend he has achincha shakti that his potencies are inconceivable why is that important to understand in relation to like krishna's rasa lila Because, uh, Maharaj, many of the uh, people get attracted to higher planetary system and uh, the pleasures that we get there in Swarga and higher planets. So, uh, when we understand that even this, those planets are temporary and uh, there also there are all the sufferings existing, uh, then only we will get attracted to uh, the spiritual world and the eternal. Mm. Yeah, but there's another reason why we would... Hare Maharaj. Yes. Yeah, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, when we see this um, material world, we'll be able to relate to ourselves. That means first let us know what we can relate, then only we'll be able to understand the unknown. Yes, I'm, 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 yes, I'm thinking of something else. Uh, Hare Krishna. Yes. Uh, normally in this world, people talk so many things about Krishna without knowing who Krishna is, especially about Rasalila and other things. They say that how he can dance with other people's wife and all those things they talk. But once they know how great Krishna is, then they will not be able to talk. Otherwise, straight away, if they go to the 10th uh, canto, they will not know who Krishna is and they will make comments. But if they know how great he is, how he is maintaining the entire universe, entire planets, and all those things, then they will not be able to make this type of comments. Uh -huh. Yes, that's good. Yes, P there is the, the mood, you know, people want to be God, even. You know, they claim they're all God, that, oh, I've become God, I've realized I'm God. And they want to imitate Krishna's pastimes. And so, it's important for us to hear about the Lord's external, uh, the Lord's pastimes in the creation and performing the creation of the universe. It's important for us to understand his inconceivable potencies before we try to even consider about his internal potencies and his confidential pastimes with the devotees. This, this will help to eliminate all of these so-called gods, these imposters who claim themselves to be God. So like that. Uh, okay, going ahead, uh, text number seven describes another question. How does the Lord engage his energies and expansions in the maintenance and destruction of the universes? So, we know 
there's phases of the material world, there's creation, maintenance and destruction. So first we wanted, they wanted to hear about, first uh, Maharaj Parikshit asked about creation and now he's asking about maintenance and destruction. Uh, how does it all happen? How does the Lord do it? Does he use his energies or his expansions? How is it all arranged? And then text number nine. Does the Lord directly deal with the modes of nature in his acts or, or does he act through his expansions? Does he do it directly or does he act through his expansions? Of course, we know that the Lord, his business is enjoying. Right? Lord Krishna is the supreme enjoyer. He doesn't have to take up the work of creation. It's all done through his expansions. Anyway, this point has, these points have to be clarified for us. So, Krishna's relationship with the material energy. Would someone like to read? Krishna's relationship with the material energy. An inexperienced boy may be struck with wonder by seeing the impersonal actions of electronics or many other wonderful things conducted by electrical energy. But an experienced man knows that behind the action is a living man who creates such energy. Just a minute. Yeah, go ahead. Similarly, the so-called scholars and philosophers of the world may by mental speculation present so many utopian theories about the impersonal creation of the universe. But an intelligent devotee of the Lord, by studying the Bhagavad Gita, can know that behind the creation is the hand of the Supreme Lord. Just as in the generating electrical powerhouse, there is the resident engineer. Okay. So, Prabhupada is making the point for us. We have to understand what would you say? What's, what's the atheistic idea about creation? Just a minute. Yes? What is the atheist? How do the atheists understand creation? Hare Krishna Maharaj, the atheists think that the world has come into being just by its own. There is no person behind, there is no creator. Right. Yes. Did you read that in the Bhagavad Gita? Did you read, did you read about this in Bhagavad Gita? Yes, Maharaj. Parasya Shakti Vividaiva Shuyate. The Lord says that I am behind all the creation. But where about? But in the in the Bhagavad Gita it also said that that there's a class of people who say that there's no God. No, that's not. That, but there's another section. They said they say this world is unreal and it has no other purpose than sense gratification is produced simply by sex desire. This or a Darwin theory, you're telling that it's a big bang. Just, just a minute though, I'm, we're talking, I'm talking, in chapter 16, the divine and demoniac nature are described. Right? Lord Krishna describes the demoniac nature. And he describes how the demons, how they understand the world. There's Ishvara Ham Ham Bogi. Ah, yes, right. Ishvara Ham Ham. They say 
the, the, there is no God, it's created simply by sex desire, it has no other purpose but for sense gratification. So the, the mm -hmm. demonic, yes? yes? Uh, they say asatyam apratishtam te also, that this world is unreal, unreal with no foundation. Yes, no asatyam apratishtam te jagad ahur anaishwaram, right. That there's no controller, like, and, and how does it all come about? By chance. And then, of course, we can say you have the Darwin's theory also, that everything has just evolved. So Darwin's ancestors were monkeys. They say everything is by chance. But these so-called big philosophers and scientists, their homes didn't come about by chance. And the, the money they get paid, the salaries they earn, are not by chance. <laughs> you know, they, people talk philosophy, but they don't live it. Very rarely anybody actually lives according to the philosophy. The people, just like so many people, they may be impersonalists, and they may talk about impersonalism, but they don't live as an impersonalist. They don't follow that philosophy in their life. So that here also we, we want to understand the material world, that there is a cause, there is a personality behind it. But for atheists, and atheism is so common in the world today. Some devotees were telling me they they were uh, study, they were in uh, the Universe, National University in Australia, ANU, Australian National University in Canberra, and they told me they have an atheist, an atheist society. You know, these are supposed to be intelligent people studying in the university, and they go, to, they take part in the the atheist society. And when they see our devotees chanting and dancing, they laugh, you know, they think, just look at these sentimentalists. And even atheism is so prominent that sometimes these atheist societies, they, they put advertisements like on buses. In, in England, they have these big double-decker buses and they put big, they do advertising along the side of the bus. And so the, the atheist society, they put things on the side of the bus telling people, why should you believe in God? You don't need to believe in God. If God is real, then why is the world the way it is, right? What are some of the arguments of the atheists? What kind of things will they say? The atheists, they like to tell us how there's so much suffering in the world, people are in, in so many difficult conditions. How could God make a world like that where so much, where so much, where there's so much suffering and so much misery? And so they, they cannot understand how there is God and how God has his own abode. So people are very unintelligent when it comes to thinking about life and about the cause of the the cause of life and the, our purpose in being here. But as Prabhupada says, an intelligent devotee, by studying the Bhagavad Gita, he can know that there is the hand of God behind everything. Some, you know, people are born into often atheistic cultures. And there are countries in the world, there are countries in the world where they indoctrinate people with atheism. Just like, you know, I, I, I preach in China. China is a, a big country, big population. And it's a standard part 
for everyone to study uh, Marxism. Karl Marx, who established this communist philosophy. And the, a big part of Marxism is that atheism, that religion is seen as the opium of the people. And people are, they're, they're just indoctrinated from the very beginning of their life. This is in colleges and universities, even in schools. They're indoctrinated in these things, in atheism. And America is not so much better. In America, they had, you know, they used to have prayer. But some years ago, one American politician, a woman, she got a bill passed to stop prayer in the school. She said, it's not good that we indoctrinate people to pray to God and to believe in God. People should be allowed to decide for themselves if they want to believe in God. So on the basis of her uh, motion, they passed that bill and they stopped prayer in the school. Previously they were praying every day, but this politician got it stopped. And so America is not so much better now. The whole world, atheism, is there for many people. So it's a difficult job to get people to understand these things. We're trying to preach. So intelligent devotees, they can understand. Behind everything there's the Supreme Lord. Yes, someone like to read this for us? Hare Krishna. The conclusion is, therefore, that a serious devotee must first approach a spiritual master who is only is well was sorry, who is not only well was in the Vedic literature, but also a great devotee with factual realization of the Lord and his different energies. A bona fide spiritual master like Sukadeva Goswami does not speak about the Lord only in the matter of his internal potencies, but also explains how he associates with his eternal potencies. External potencies. External potencies. Yes, external. So, the internal potencies, that's the Lord's pastimes in the spiritual world and with his confidential devotees. And the external potencies we're going to hear about today and tomorrow in relation to his work of creation for the material world. Right? Yes? Please read. Sri Vishnu Chakravarti offers his good counsel to the interested Vaishnavas when he says that they should not be interested in hearing only about the Lord's activities, like the Rasa Leela, but must be keenly interested in his pastimes, in his features of Purushavataras, in connection with the Shruti Tattva, Shristi Tattva, creation functions, following the examples of Maharaj Parishit, the ideal disciple, and the Sukadeva Goswami, the ideal spiritual master. Mm. All right. So we have to be keenly interested, <laughs> not just only interested to hear Rasa Leela. We have to purify ourselves. You want to hear about Rasa Leela. If we don't purify ourselves, then certainly we will misunderstand it and the tendency will be there that we want to imitate, we want to do like Krishna. So we have to hear about the Lord's inconceivable potencies and how his different expansions in the form of Purusha avatars arrange the creation for him. All right. Well, so here is Sutta Goswami speaking to the sages in Naimisharanya. Sutta Goswami said, when Sukadeva Goswami was thus requested by the king to describe the creative energy of the Personality of Godhead, he then systematically remembered the Master of the Senses, Sri Krishna, and to reply properly, he spoke thus. Right? So, now we've, we've come up to Sukadeva Goswami's prayers, which are here 
beginning from text number 11, right? Would someone like to read text number 11 for us, please? Hare Krishna Maharaj. So the watch uh, uh, two four eleven. So the watch uh, iti upa mantrito ragna guna no kathane hare he rishi kesham anu smritya prati vaktum prachakrame. Translation Sutta Goswami said when Shukadev Goswami was thus requested by the king to describe the creative energy of the personality of Godhead, he then systematically remembered the master of the senses, Sri Krishna, and to reply properly, he spoke thus. Hare Krishna, Dhanur Pranam. Okay, thank you. So that's Sutta Goswami. Really, we haven't got to Sukadeva Goswami yet. Text number 12. Someone else read. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Parasme Purushaya Bhuyase Sat Ud Bhavasthana Nirodha Nilaya Drihita Shakti Tritiya Tritaya Yadehinam Antar Bhavaya Nupalakshya Vartmane Translation? Yes. Shukadeva Goswami said, let me offer my respectful obeisances unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who, for the creation of the material world, accepts the three modes of nature. He is the complete whole residing within the body of everyone, and his ways are inconceivable. Mm. Wonderful. So this is the opening prayer of Sukadeva Goswami. We should understand the need to offer prayers before we begin to speak. Suk Sukadeva Goswami had been asked by Maharaj Parikshit to speak about the Lord's creative potency. So before Sukadeva Goswami begins to reply to the questions directly, he first of all offers prayers to the Lord. And Sukadeva Goswami is such an enlightened soul, he can compose his own prayers. Uh, I remember uh, Srila Prabhupada's very first disciple. Before Prabhupada went to America, he had one disciple. His name was Acharya Prabhaka. He was a very, very learned, very educated man. And uh, actually, when he would speak, I had, I had the opportunity to hear him speak, he, would, he could compose poetry spontaneously, speak verses, just like here Sukadeva Goswami doing the same thing. You know, Sukadeva Goswami, usually when we speak Srimad Bhagavatam, we will take a few verses, you know, well-known verses like Narayanam Namaskritjam, like that, and Nasta prays for Badreshu, like you know, we'll, compose, we'll speak some verses from the scriptures which are already composed. But Sukadeva Goswami, he's just composing these prayers spontaneously within his mind. And it's important for us to take the blessings of the Lord before we try to speak. Not only in speaking, of course, we offer prayers before. Uh, but before eating also, and before everything which we do, if we want to do it really successfully in Krishna consciousness, we should offer prayers. We have to pray to Krishna. Please uh, empower me to be your representative, to act on your behalf. So it's an important part of devotional service, offering prayers. And we're so fortunate that in the Srimad Bhagavatam, so many wonderful prayers are there. So I think uh, there's a number of verses here in in the Srimad, in this chapter of Srimad. The rest of the chapter is actually Sukadeva Goswami's prayers, because 25, verse 25 is the end of the chapter. 
so we're hearing Sukadeva Goswami offer his prayers. And he's teaching all of us how to pray to the Lord. Uh, Okay, that was text number 12. Can someone read text number 13? Uyo yapna sad prichina chide yo satam Asam babaya kila sattva bhutaye Hum saapuna bara humsya ashrame Vyavastita nam anamrukya dashushe Translation I again offer my respectful obeisances under the form of complete existence and transcendence, who is the liberator of the pious devotees from all distresses and the destroyer of the further advances in atheistic temperament of the non-devotee demons. For the transcendentalists who are situated in the topmost spiritual perfection, he grants their specific destinations. Yes, right. So, text 13, is, it seems to indicate that Lord Krishna is partial, right? The partiality of Lord Krishna. Do you, can you think of the verse in the Bhagavad Gita where it appears Lord Krishna is impartial or partial? Tamoham Sarva Bhuteshu, Maharaj? Yes, right. Go ahead, say the whole verse. Samoham Sarva Bhuteshu, Nami Dveshosti Napriyaha, Ye Bhajanti Tumam Bhaktya, Mai Tete Shuchapyaham. Yes, do you know the translation? I am the no one, uh, and I'm uh, means I should read from the translation or I should recollect whatever I can. As you like. Okay. So what I remember I'll just tell uh, is uh, I envy no one and uh, I am equal to everyone. Uh, however, who worship me with uh, full devotion in their heart I live in them and they live in me. Oh, very good. Yes, very nice. That's right. That's, a, that's Krishna's partiality. Now, is Krishna partial? Is it, does it mean Krishna is partial? Well, certainly he has a special affection for his devotees, right? And as Prabhupada explains, it's natural. He's, and he give, Prabhupada gives the example, just like a woman, she will like children. But she has a special affection for her own child. And it's natural. She has a love for all children, but she has a special feeling for her own children. In the same way, Lord Krishna is equal to everyone. But if somebody renders service to him and has done some if someone is actually taken shelter of him and is devoted to him, then there's a special relationship there. So that partiality of Krishna, it's not a defect. It's not a fault on the part of Krishna. Rather, it indicates his wonderful qualities and his, his care and concern for his devotees that Krishna has a special love for his devotees. That, that should be there. And that's encouraging for devotees to know that how much Krishna cares for his devotees. Uh, now, some, sometimes we say the work of dealing with the, punishing the demons that is not actually Krishna's work. Who's going, to, who's going to do that? Vasudeva Krishna. Yeah, Vasudeva Krishna. Or? 
Fixed to the lineage. Yeah, and Krishna's different incarnations and avatars coming in the world and do that. But of course, Krishna in his original form as Shamsundar Krishna, his business is just to enjoy. And he enjoys himself most with his devotees. He enjoys the loving relationships, either with the you know, with the cowherd boys and with Mother Yashoda and Nanda Maharaj, with the gopis, this is his enjoyment. He enjoys it in this way. But he's not, at the same time, he, he's not partial to the extent that he, he favors someone more than another. He's beneficial to everyone. And Lord Bish, uh, Bhishma Dev, when he was on the bed of arrows in the first chapter, first canto rather, Bhishma Dev on the bed of arrows, he recalled also about Lord Krishna and he was describing how Lord Krishna was so kind to him that although Bhishma had been fighting against Krishna, that Lord Krishna was so kind that he came before him at the time of him leaving the body. So Bhishma Dev appreciated Lord Krishna's partiality towards his devotees so much that, that as Bhishma is leaving the world, Lord Krishna personally came there to be with him. Okay, so hmm. yeah. yeah, we see Krishna is beneficial to everyone. We know Krishna comes and in his different forms, he can kill the demons. But is that is that's his is that an impartiality? Well, it's beneficial for them because when he kills them, they're liberated. They get liberation. Krishna arranges for them to be liberated. So that is his kindness to them. So it just a kindness which comes in a different way. So Krishna, this is all Krishna's inconceivable potency. We see also this uh, impartiality, it's described like uh, his relationship with his servants is, is like a kind father who is always there behind the child, helping the child and guiding them and correcting them. At the same time, if Lord Krishna sees faults in someone, Lord Krishna will correct them. And when Lord Krishna sees the service attitude in someone, Krishna will appreciate it. And we know how Putana came with poison on her breast and Lord Krishna thought, and Putana also came disguised as a gopi. But Lord Krishna took her back to Godhead to be his nurse in the spiritual world. And similarly, Pondraka, Pondraka stuck two arms on to make himself in a, to give himself a four-arm form. So when Krishna killed Pondraka, he also got to go back to Godhead because he saw he wants he wants to have a four-arm form. So he took him to Vaikuntha. He got him a place there in Vaikuntha so he could have four arms. Although he was a demon coming, insulting and challenging Krishna, and Krishna killed him but liberated him. So there are many examples of Lord Krishna's impartiality and, and it's, it's all for the benefit of everyone. Krishna's beneficial for everyone. In other words, he fulfills everyone's desires. All right, are there any questions?
Okay, we'll go ahead. Let's see. Yes, somebody, please read. Krishna. Namo Namaste Swarishubaya Satvatam Vidura Kastaya Mukmuku Yojinam Nirasta Samyati Sayena Radasha Swadamini Brahmani Ramshyate Namaha Translation Let translation by Shri Prabhupada Jai Shri let me offer my respectful obeisances unto him who is the associate of the members of the Yidu dynasty and who is always a problem for the non-devotees. He is the supreme enjoyer of both the material and spiritual worlds. Yet he enjoys his own abode in the spiritual sky. There is no one equal to him because his transcendental opulence is immeasurable. Alright, so... As described there is transcendental opulence is immeasurable so Krishna's inconceivable potencies again being mentioned there a performance of religious religious performances yes that was text what text number was that Prabhu uh, 14 Maharaj Text 14, all right. Here, let's see. Here we have a quote. We'll jump. Okay, 15, we didn't read yet. 15 and 16, we still have to read. So, someone read 15. 15? Mm -hmm. Yetvandanam yatshavanam yadarhanam Lukasya sadyo vidunoti kalmasham Tasme shavasena monamam Translation by Mr. Vandres A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shri Prabhupada Let me offer my respectful obeisances unto the all auspicious Lord Shri Krishna about whom glorification, remembrance, audience, prayers, hearing and worship can at once cleanse the effects of all sins of the performed. Hare Krishna. Mm. All right. Yes. All sins can be removed by devotional service. So this is the power of devotional service. Even though Krishna is not present, but if we just remember him, if we can just remember Lord Krishna, although he's not physically present, then we can destroy all sins. And even just one time remembering Krishna's glories, it can remove all of our sins. So this is the wonder of devotional service. Yes, next verse, number, is it 16? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Vichakshanaya charano pasadana Santam vijasyo bayato antaratmanaham Vidanti brahma gatim kataklamas let me offer my respectful obeisance again and again unto the all auspicious of all auspicious Lord Krishna, the highly intellectual, simply by surrendering unto his lotus feet, are relieved of all attachment to present and future existence, and also without difficulty progress towards spiritual existence. Okay. So here's a quote from the purport here, number 16. Yeah, you can read it, Prabhu. Attainment of this perfection of life is easily available to the pure devotees of the Lord without his undergoing any difficult method of perfection. Such a devotion service is full of kirtanam, maranam, ishnam, etc. As mentioned in the previous verse. One must therefore adopt this simple way of devotion life in order to attain the highest perfection available 
in any category of human form of life in any part of the world. Mm. Okay. So, simple, further simple. Any, any, anyone can do these things, kirtan, smaranam, remembering the Lord. This is devotional life. You can get the greatest benefit. And it doesn't matter where you are in any form of life, in any category of human form of life, in any part of the world. So this is the power of bhakti. However, Prabhupada, he does talk about the importance of being above all pretension. Pretension. He talks about yeah, the pure devotional service means to be above all pretension. Pretension comes from the word pretend. So if people are not genuine in their, con in their practice of devotional service, they're just simply pretending, then that will not be pure devotion. That will not get the real result. We have to be above that pretension. So we do get sometimes people, they just pretend to be devotees. They have some other motive. And they come for some time and then they go. That happens. We've seen many people like that. But that is not pure devotion. We should understand that those who are actually real devotees, they will never go. I was listening to one devotee. Uh, devotee, he's actually work, he's uh, concerned in, over in the UK in Oxford. He's running He's running the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies there, and they they have many programs. They have visiting professors come and everything, and they do a lot of work with the with the big scholars and academics. And so he said he always likes to ask two questions from people. One is, how did you come to Krishna consciousness? And then they, that okay, that's the step, that's easy to understand. Everybody, you know, what they want to know: How did you become a devotee? But the second question he asks is: Is it why did you stay? <laughs> why did you stay a devotee? Because people do come to Krishna consciousness and, and they go, they come and they go. You know, we see it well, quite a quite a bit, unfortunately. So much so that, you know, I remember we had a program called Reuniting Prabhupada's Family because we felt so many devotees have come to Krishna consciousness and gone away that if we could bring back all the devotees who have been devotees, we'd have so many devotees. So many people have been through Krishna consciousness. And so why do they go away? So why, why they go away, that's one thing, but why do they stay? That's a... A more important question, actually. Why do they stay? So, they, they have to be genuine. That's the main thing. To stay in Krishna consciousness, their motivation has to be very pure. Okay, so here's from Prabhupada's lecture on Srimad Bhagavatam, First Canto, Chapter 8, given in Mayapur, 1974. Prabhupada saying, out of twelve authorities, Sukha, Sukadeva Goswami is authority. Mahajano yena gata sapanta. Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, Madhya Lila 17.186. Right? That's Mahajano, that's the, the, the last line of the verse, right? It's a, a well known verse, huh? well-known verse. How does the Bible <laughs> should be well-known. I've forgotten it right now. Can't think of it anyway. But uh, the dry arguments are inconclusive. And the scripture, the opinion of the scriptures is also not conclusive. 
and great rishis and sages will argue, they will come to no real conclusion. But the absolute truth is hidden in the hearts of the pure devotees and one can understand it simply by following in the footsteps of the Mahajans. So that is the, the verse from the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Uh, it's actually taken from the Mahabharata, this particular verse, which we're just quoting the last line here, right? And so the, the absolute truth is hidden in the hearts of the Mahajans, the great souls, and we should understand it by following in their footsteps. So Srila Prabhupada said, we have to follow the authority. So he says, by simply by performing these processes, Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, then what you are, Lokashya Sajit Sad Lokashya Sadyo Vinoti Kaumasam. This material contamination will be washed off. Lokasya sadhya. When washed off? Immediately, sir. Immediately. No waiting. Sadhya. This is Krishna consciousness movement. So, very powerful Prabhupada uh, quoting here for us. These statements from the scriptures, how we can get purified immediately, just simply by this process. And this point comes up also, you see in the third canto, when you do Kapila Shiksha, it's also there stated by Devahuti, that anyone who once chants the holy name, then they can immediately perform, they're qualified to, to do uh, a Vedic Yagya, because just they've become purified just by chanting the holy name. So we should understand the power of Bhakti, the power of the Shravanam and Kirtanam Vishnu, that it destroys even the Parabdha Karma, even the Parabdha Karma, which is a karma which is already manifest, it can be all overcome by the power of devotional service. So this is an important point to remember, that all kinds of karma can be removed by bhakti. Only bhakti has that power to remove all the different phases of sinful reactions. And parabdha karma is like the, the heaviest phase of sinful reaction. It's the karma which we're suffering from. So it can all be overcome by devotional service. And Prabhupada says here, he said, Loka Shasadya, immediately, no waiting. And so that's a good thing to know, isn't it? No waiting, you know, if you know, if you think you have to wait, oh, but no waiting, Prabhupada says. Oh, well, the scriptures say no waiting. Prabhupada is quoting the scriptures. Okay, oh, Okay, text number 18. Let's see, we're up. Did we do 17 yet? Not yet, Prabhu. Not okay. yet, Maharaj. Go ahead, let's have 17. Hare Krishna. Tapasvino dana parayasha svino manasvino mantra vidasu mangala chemam navindanti vinayat arpanam tasmai subhadra shavase namo namaha. Translation, this divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Sri Prabhupada. Let me offer my respectful obeisance unto the all auspicious Lord Sri Krishna again and again, because the great learned sages, the great performers of charity, the great workers of distinction, the great philosophers and mystics, the great chanters of the Vedic hymns, and the great followers of the Vedic principles cannot achieve any fruitful result without dedication of such great qualities to the service of the Lord. Right. So this is a nice verse which glorifies the power of bhakti, that one may do all of these other pious activities. You know, so many things were mentioned like giving charity and uh, 
different rituals or Vedic sacrifice, but they're all useless unless there's bhakti. Without bhakti, all of these different things, they just, they'll just be material. They won't give you the real spiritual benefit. You're not going to get purified by doing them unless there's real devotion there. So, Sridhar Swami and Jiva Goswami, they mention this verse in their commentaries. And Jiva Goswami says that even a, a sinful person can be purified by bhakti. Just by doing a little bhakti, even somebody may be sinful because devotion is so powerful. And Sridhar Swami talks about how these other things are just useless if there's no bhakti, there's no devotion. Not going to do any good at all. And so we have we should understand how important it is to cultivate this mood of devotion. You're going to do some activities, you're going to give charity, you're going to do this or that. Do it with devotion. Do it for Krishna. Right? That's why we, we, it's good to offer these prayers. You can offer prayers like the, like Sukadeva Goswami is offering these prayers. It's so nice. Okay, go ahead. Let's hear text 18. This is a very important verse, powerful verse. Hare Krishna. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes. Kirata Hunandra Pulinda Pulkasha. Abhi Rashumbha Yavana. Translation by Shri Prabhupada. Kirata Huna Andhra Pulinda Pulkasa Abhira Shumbha Yavana Members of the Khasa races and even Others addicted to sinful acts can be purified by taking shelter of the devotees of the Lord due to His being the supreme power. I beg to offer my respectful obeisances unto Him. Yes, right. This is a very important verse, often quoted. Definitely want to try to memorize it and use it in your preaching. And it mentions about all the different sinful races, <laughs> right? Kir, Kirata, Kirata, who are they? A province of old Bharata. Where is it? In Bihar, Maharaj? It's Bihar, Chota Nagpur, he says. Oh, really? Uh-huh, okay. That, that's what the purport says. Mm -hmm. And then Han, the Han, the, the Han. Russia. That's G Germany. Germany. Yeah, Germany. Germany. We, are, we often speak about the Huns as the Germans. So it's it's there. That's, that word is used today. Kirita Hun Andhra. Of course, Andhra, we know Andhra. That's Andhra Pradesh, right? <laughs> the name is still there today. Of course, actually, we have more temples in Andhra Pradesh than any other state in India. <laughs> but still, there's good and bad everywhere. Kirita Hunandra Pulinda. Where is Pulinda? It mentioned they have. Is it a province name Pulinda Maharaj in mm. the purport? Yeah, I don't know where it this is. This country. I never heard anywhere called... The Greeks are known as Pulindas. Oh, oh, the Greeks, that's right, the Greeks, yeah. He mentioned the Greeks, yeah. The Alexander the Great, they came there and conquered India. So Pulindas conquered India. Pulinda Pulkasha. And Ab Abira, Abira, that's a... province was situated on the river Saraswati in Sin. The modern Sindh province formerly extended on the other side of the Arabian Sea. Okay, Abira, and then Abira Shumba. 
inhabitants of the Kanka province of old Bharata, mentioned in the Mahabharata. The Yavanas, we know the Yavanas, that's the Turks, right? Yes, yes, Maharaj. And the Yavanas, that name, that's one of the sons of Maharaj Yayati who went there. Many Kshatriyas, Prabhupada said the Kshatriyas were running away from Parasuram. So many Kshatriya kings had gone to these different places to escape, right? And that's how, of, and, but then of course they gave up the Brahminical culture, so they became Yavanas, they became degraded. Abhirasumba Yavana Kasha, then Kasha, Kasha Desh. Kasha Desh. The Mongolians, the Chinese. The Chinese, right, China. Sometimes Prabhupada would say Kirita was, was Africa actually also. But here in the, in the purport there, it, said, it mentions it as being Bihar. So all different races who are addicted to sinful acts, they can all be delivered by Prabha Vishnave Namaha, by the powerful Vishnu. Prabha Vishnu, the powerful Vishnu. They can all be delivered. So, in the purport, Prabhupada's purport is very important. Here's some part of it, here. Uh, even those who are constantly... Go ahead. Even those who are constantly engaged in sinful acts are all corrigible to the standard of perfect human beings if they take shelter of the devotees of the Lord. Jesus Christ and Muhammad, two powerful devotees of the Lord, have done tremendous service on behalf of the Lord on the surface of the globe. Right. So, all sin, sinful acts are all corrigible, means they, they can be reformed, they can be corrected to the standard of perfect human beings if they take shelter of the devotees. And then Prabhupada mentions Lord Jesus Christ and Muhammad, two powerful devotees of the Lord. And they've done tremendous service on behalf of the Lord. And so, how, how do we understand it? Of course, generally when Prabhupada would speak about Christianity and Islam also, that this is a meat-eating religion, that this is, uh, the Shastras are more for the meat-eaters. But Prabhupada has an appreciation for them in the sense that they have developed some respect for God. They believe in God. They have religion. At least they have some faith in something. They have some religion. And that's, that's very good today because we know so much godlessness. I was speaking about atheism earlier. And so, people who are Christian and Islam, they're, they're pious, they have a religion, they have faith in something. They have faith in something more than just simply sense gratification. So, we appreciate that, that Lord Jesus and Muhammad, that they brought people to a higher level of consciousness. Because people without religion, then they're simply animal. And if you read also the, the light of the Bhagavad, the light of the Bhagavad, which is written by Prabhupada, there he mentions how there's a need for all the different religions to come together and to loudly chant the glories of God to all the non-devotees, to the, to the atheists, to the, the non-believers, to try to awaken them, to give them God consciousness. So we're not against other religions. Prabhupada often made that point. We're not against other religions. We're non-sectarian. We believe in all different religious traditions. The, the Quran one man came to our temple in Calcutta, he was, a, he was a Muslim himself, and he was teaching English in one of the colleges in Calcutta, and he'd written a book on the Bhagavad Gita and the Quran, 
and he showed in so many places that Bhagavad Gita and the Quran, they're saying the same thing. And th this man actually, he was a vegetarian. Although he was a Muslim, he was a vegetarian with his whole family. They were vegetarians and they were Islam, but he appreciated also Bhagavad Gita. Very nice man. And of course, Christians also, Christians, they can also be good people, devotees. So we appreciate the work done by Lord Jesus and Muhammad. They were like Vaishnavas. Lord Jesus Christ, he had that mood of compassion when he was being nailed on the cross. He prayed, he prayed, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. So just like when Haridas Thakur was being whipped in 22 marketplaces, he prayed that Krishna, don't punish these people who are whipping me, they're only doing their job. In so a similar manner, Lord Jesus, when he was crucified, he prayed to God, he said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Jesus never said he was God, he always spoke about our Father. And similarly, Muhammad is also speaking about Allah, God, they believe in a personal God. They just have different names in different cultures. Okay, so it's a very nice verse, this text 18, it shows the it shows the, the, how, how devotees must, how we must follow and how we have a great responsibility in our preaching work. Actually, there's a, there's a sentence there in the, in the purport where Prabhupada speaks about how the devotees should become leaders and they should influence other people. He said, we've already set up the society, ISKCON society, and these people, they can actually purify the hearts of all these corrupt politicians. And we want to bring people to a level of God consciousness. So Prabhupada was talking about how the de devotees should actually become leaders of society. So it's a great responsibility and how Devotees have to be very pure and very strict in their own practice, right? We should be merciful with others and very strict with ourselves. That is the mood of devotee. So we don't want to miss out. We don't want to be negligent. We should be very conscious and very careful in our preaching work to show the right example to others. And we re respect other religious traditions, have respect for, for these other religions. Are there any comments or questions on this? So we have to, this verse of course is about encouraging preaching, that we have to preach. These same people are sinful, but they can be delivered by our preaching. We can understand what kind of Vaishnav you are, how many people you've made into devotees. We have to make, we have to, we should be like a touchstone, just like the touchstone can convert everything to gold. And so devotees should change the hearts of people, make them also devotees. So how much people will respect our movement will depend on us, on how we reflect the qualities. Just like people had so much respect for Lord Jesus Christ and for Prophet Muhammad, that they followed them. They have so many followers. In the same way, if we properly follow the principles of Krishna consciousness 
then the Krishna consciousness movement will also be successful and there will be so many people. Okay, so would someone please read this now? Hare Krishna, a pure devotee can purify the entire world. The only qualification is that one takes shelter of a pure devotee of the Lord who has thorough knowledge in the transcendental science of Krishna. Anyone from any part of the world who becomes well conversant in the science of Krishna becomes a pure devotee and a spiritual master for the general mass of people and may reclaim them by purification of heart. Though a person be even the most sinful man, he can act... Just a minute. Yes, he can act. Yes. Can you see it, Madhuji? Yeah, he can at once be purified by systematic contact with a pure Vaishnava. Yeah, he can at once be purified. Right, we were speaking about that. He can at once be purified by systematic contact with a pure Vaishnava. So, the point is made, any person, any part of the world, you know, sometimes people have uh, narrow vision, we think, oh, you know, just like people, they thought Prabhupada going to America. Why you want to go to America? Oh, people are all de degraded there. They're all sinful people. Why go off there? But, and, and they were even telling Prabhupada, you know, the one man was telling Prabhupada, if you're going to go to America, you have to learn to use a knife and fork. And, but Prabhupada told the man, he said, I'm not going to teach, I'm not going to learn from them, I'm going to teach them. And Prabhupada did, he went to America and he taught us how to eat with our right hand. We didn't know right from left, but Prabhupada taught us, don't touch food with the left hand, just eat with the right hand. And Prabhupada trained us in these things. He taught us how to use, how to properly eat food how to honour prasana, and he taught us about wearing the dhoti and shaving our heads, all of these things, putting on tilak. He, he didn't go to learn from us, he taught us, we followed him. So, mahajano yena gata sapanta, we follow the mahajans. So Prabhupada was teaching us, this is the spiritual master. Showing the people how to properly act. Okay. Oh, okay, I'll go back to this slide here. Yes. Please read. Directly taking shelter. What? Directly taking, sh directly taking shelter. No, what's the title? Krishna? What's the title? Sorry about that, Maharaj. Electric current. Okay, thank you. Directly taking shelter of Krishna or to take shelter of a pure devotee who is under the shelter of Krishna. Mad Ashrayaha. So if one takes shelter of a pure devotee, just like electricity, the powerhouse is far away, but the power is coming. Suppose your body is electrified, and if I touch, then my body immediately becomes electrified. And if somebody touches me, then others' body, this is electric. Similarly, one who is pure devotee, he is authorized by Krishna, he is electrified. Lecture from Srimad Bhagavatam 1712, Srindavan 76. Thank you. <coughs> All right. So, the principle of purification. We take shelter of a pure devotee, and Prabhupada gives an example, like the electric current. Just as the current flows through, so, we can also be purified, the, you know, from his body ecstatic prema emanates, right? We're saying chaksu dhanu delo ye jami jami prabhu se, right? We think about the pure devotee that from him ecstatic prema emanates, by him ignorance is destroyed. Like that. So you get near to the pure devotee, you can, you can feel the spiritual energy. You think you could be, go near Prabhupada and not be affected? You would feel, you could feel the potency, the purity, 
just by being near to Prabhupada. So that is the power of the pure devotee, just like an electric current. And pure devotee, he is authorized by Krishna. So we want to get that shelter that's important for us. So the power, the Prabhavishnave Namaha purifies us. All right, next one. Read. Hare Krishna Maharaj, guiding human society. Instead of running a godless civilization in the present context of the world situation, if the leadership of world uh, world affairs is ent entrusted to the devotees of the Lord, for which a worldwide organization under the name and style of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness has already been started, then by the grace of the Almighty Lord, there can be a thorough change of heart in human beings all over the world because the devotees of the Lord the devotees of the Lord are able authorities to effect such a change by purifying the dust own minds of the people in general. All right. So, yes, here's this point, but Prabhupada saying that the leadership of world af affairs is entrusted to the devotees of the Lord. So, Prabhupada wanted to see this kind of thing. He wants that uh, the world situation can be rectified if the leadership of world affairs is entrusted to devotees of the Lord. And then Prabhupada talks about ISKCON has already been started. Then, by the grace of the Almighty Lord, there can be a thorough change of heart in human beings all over the world. Because the devotees are authorities to effect such a change by purifying the dust-worn minds of the people. So Prabhupada's expectations for the Krishna consciousness movement. Can you think of some examples? Do we see any examples of this anywhere in the world? Devotees becoming very prominent in world affairs. Uh, in America, Tulsi Gabbard. Yes, right. I was also thinking of her, right. Yeah, she's, she's doing it, right. She's running, uh, she's way up there. She's, you know, very prominent in the politics there in America now, right. So her mother and father were taking her to Krishna conscious programs and she's very familiar with the Bhagavad Gita. Hmm. Yes, so we're seeing some of these, uh, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing something like this begin to take effect. When Prabhupada went to um, Mauritius, he said Mauritius should become the first Krishna conscious country in the world because they have quite a Hindu, big Hindu population there. So Prabhupada was encouraging the people in Mauritius that they should all take to Krishna consciousness. You now it's a small island, the population is there, maybe about what, one million or so in Mauritius. And so they have a very, they have a, a couple of temples there in Mauritius. Anyway, the idea is devotees that they will become, they will, they will, if, if they are going to do these kind of things, then what is required? First of all, they have to be very good devotees. They have to be very strict and pure, right? They have to be really on the mark. They shouldn't be faulty in their behavior. They should be perfect in their behavior and in their character. Everything should be above suspicion. There should be no doubt about them. And they should preach as well. They have to also preach. But 
They have to be expert preachers. They have to preach in such a manner that they can uh, influence people, not offend people. They have to make friends and influence people to take up Krishna consciousness. Yeah? Any comments? Thank you, Mr. Maharaj. Yeah. Maharaj, one question is, uh, you said it's like electricity, how the purple produces like electricity, now it will uh, kind of emulate make other devotees. But there are some incidents, you know, in Srila Prabhupada's own, some of the, there are very few of them, they left the movement. What could be the reason? How would they, something, what exactly went wrong in their life? Leaders? Yeah, so some of the disciples, they left the movement. Why? Well, di different reasons why people leave the movement. You know, one reason why people leave the movement sometimes is because of offences. They commit offences against devotees. And it may be offences against devotees, it may be offences against the deities or something. There are different reasons why people may leave the movement. Some people, they just want they want sense gratification. They just have to have, they're not able to control their senses any longer and they have to, and they feel that to remain a devotee and have sense gratification is not good. So they go away to do their sense gratification. And then after they've had their sense gratification, then maybe towards the end of the life they may come back. So we see that sometimes, we see some devotees that after some time, you know, that they, they came to the movement when they were young and they were not very mature and they still had strong desires for sense gratification. So sometimes they go away and they, they feel, I, 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 I don't want to have my sense gratification as a devotee. They go out of Krishna consciousness and have their sense gratification and after some time they come back. So, other people may be sometimes offences and they have to wait some, until the, the reactions from these offences is over and then they come back to Krishna consciousness. Thank you, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Text 18 purport. Hare Krishna, guiding human society. The politicians of the world may remain in their respective positions because the pure devotees of the Lord are not interested in political leadership or diplomatic implications. The devotees are interested only in seeing that the people in general are not misguided by political propaganda and in seeing that the valuable life of a human being is not spoiled in following a type of civilization which is ultimately doomed. If the politicians, therefore, would be guided by the good counsel of the devotees, then certainly there would be a great change in the world situation by the purifying propaganda of the devotees, as shown by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Srimad Bhagavatam 2.2.18. Yes. So, this is the, the method the devotees must follow. And, the, and it also tells us that our responsibility to remain pure and to preach. All right? We have to show people that example. We're not really interested in leadership. They can, they can, they can keep their positions, but let them become devotees. <laughs> We're not anxious for their positions, for their responsibilities, but let them do it in a manner which will be beneficial to the society. They shouldn't, they shouldn't misguide the people. They have, to, they have to understand what is the proper duty, what is the real duty of the, the leaders, the politicians. Prabhupada wanted to meet, he met Indira Gandhi. Actually, when, before he met her, Prabhupada's plan was he wanted to ask her that all the 
politicians who come in the, on the, into the parliament there, that they should all be twice initiated Brahmins and they should strictly follow four regulative principles. He wanted that. He wanted that at least they would follow these four principles. That they, they should be strict in that. No meat eating, no intoxication, no gambling, these things. He didn't want degradation among these politicians. He wanted them to be pure-hearted brahmanas. And then they can properly guide others. Of course, Prabhupada didn't really get a chance to spend much time with Indira Gandhi, but that was his thinking. He certainly had his ideas how he wanted to influence politics in India. He wanted to see the world improved. The world situation should be improved. Give the mercy of Lord Chaitanya. Have more kirtan, more chanting of the holy names of God. So this is required. This is what's needed in the world today. Okay, so let's, let me see. Uh, we, we were up to text number... We chanted uh, 18, we, we didn't chant 19, did we? Could you chant number 19? No, no, Maharaj. Yes, chant 19. Uh, yes, Hare Krishna. Translation by Srila Prabhupada He is the super soul and the supreme lord of all self-realized souls. He is the personification of the Vedas, religious scriptures and austerities. He is worshipped by Lord Brahma and Shiva and all those who are transcendental to all pretensions, being so revered with awe and veneration, may that Supreme Absolute be pleased with me. Hare Krishna. All right. Thank you. Very nice, Mataji. Very good reading. Uh, so Prabhupada talks here about pretension. This is the actual verse I was thinking on, where he's talking about pretension. Devotees should be above pretension. The Lord is above all pretension. Devotees should be above pretension. Don't pretend. Be genuine. Be sincere. And our desire should be just to please Krishna. We cannot be without desire. We're naturally, we're going to have some desire, but we, our desire should be pure. They should be for the service of Krishna. Hmm? Prabhupada in the purport quotes that verse from the Chaitanya Charitamrita about uh, uh, Krishna Bhakti Niskam Sai Shashanta, Bhukti Mukti Siddhikami Sakale Ashanta, Krishna Bhakti Niskam Sai Shashanta. Right? Only the devotee is actually peaceful because he has no material desires. He desires though. We do desire. We desire to please Krishna. We want to give service to Krishna, to pleasure to him. Uh, we saw that I was reading Krishna book the other day and was reading about Kubja. Kubja wanted to please Krishna. Krishna came to her house and she sat as Krishna, she, Krishna came to her house to make her a pure devotee. She wanted to please Krishna and she thought pleasing Krishna was to uh, have a relationship with him. And, and, but Krishna is not interested in the relationship. Krishna has so many wives and so many uh, goddesses of fortune who can all please him. But Krishna wanted to make her a pure devotee. He wants to purify her. And so we just want, we should simply desire to please Krishna. And that will save us. 
Bhukti, bhukti means we want material desires, like the karmi wants material desires, that's bhukti. And then the, the, the jnani, he wants mukti. And the yogi, he wants siddhis, he wants mystic perfections, like anima, lagima, prapti siddhi, so many asta siddhis are there. So they all have material desires. So because they have material desires, they're not peaceful. But when, if you take up bhakti yoga, if they do some, have some devotion, then they will become peaceful. So this is the meaning to be above pretension that's required to develop our devotion for Krishna. Okay, so that's text 19. Can you just read the translation, number 20? You, we don't need the Sanskrit. Yeah? Thanks. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. May Lord Sri Krishna, who is worshipable Lord of all devotees, the protector and glory of all the kings like Andaka and Vishni of the Edu dynasty, the husband of all goddesses of fortune, the director of all sacrifices, and therefore the leader of all the living entities, the controller of all intelligence, the proprietor of all planets, spiritual and material, and the supreme incarnation of the earth, the supreme all in all. Be merciful upon me. Hare Krishna. Okay. Text 20. And next one? Next verse. Hare Krishna. The personality of God and Shri Krishna, who gives liberation by thinking of his lotus feet at every second, following in the footsteps of authorities, the devotee in trance can see the absolute truth. The learned mental speculators, however, think of him according to their whims. May the Lord be pleased upon, pleased with me. So we see the mood of the prayers, right? To, may the Lord be pleased with me. This is the idea. This is how a devotee wants to think, how to please the, the Lord. Of course, we may wonder, is it possible I could please the Lord? Is it possible I could ever please Him? Well, certainly, we know the Lord is pleased simply by devotion. Where there's real devotion, then that is actually pleasing to the Lord. We want to develop that devotion. Hmm. Got my book here. Okay, so we're up to twenty. So, text number twenty two now. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Translation. May the Lord, who in the beginning of the creation amplified the potent knowledge of Brahma from within his heart and inspired him with full knowledge of creation and of his own self, and who appeared to be generated from the mouth of Brahma, be pleased with me. So again, the mood is to be, for the Lord to be pleased. We're not thinking about our own pleasure, but the mood is to please Krishna. That is very important. It's very easy to think about our own pleasure. We don't think about Krishna. So, Sukadeva Goswami is praying like this. Then text 23, May the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who enlivens the materially created bodies of the elements by laying down within the universe, and who in his Purusha incarnation 
causes the living being to be subjected to the sixteen divisions of material modes, which are his generator, be pleased to decorate my statements. So although he's, it appears like he's getting into described creation, he's still offering his prayers and he wants that the Supreme Lord will be pleased with his statements. He hasn't actually begun his description of creation yet, but he's some way he's mentioning briefly about the creation as it goes on. And then text 24, I offer my respectful obeisances unto Srila Vyasadeva, the incarnation of Vasudeva, who compiled the Vedic scriptures. The pure devotees drink up the nectarian transcendental knowledge dropping from the lotus mouth of the Lord. From the commentary, Prabhupada's purport, Prabhupada quotes Sridhar Swami, he said, Sridhar Swami has commented that the respectful obeisances are offered to Srila Vyasadeva, who is the incarnation of Vasudeva. And Srila Jiva Goswami has agreed to this, but Srila Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur has made a further advance, namely that the nectar from the mouth of Lord Krishna is transferred to his different consorts, and thus they learn the finer arts of music, dance, dressing, decoration, and all such things which are relished by the Lord. Such music, dance, and decorations enjoyed by the Lord are certainly not anything mundane, because the Lord is addressed in the very beginning as para or transcendental. This transcendental knowledge is unknown to the forgotten conditioned souls. Srila Vyasadeva, who is the incarnation of the Lord, thus compiled the Vedic literature to revive the lost memory of the conditioned souls about their eternal relationship with the Lord. One should therefore try to understand the Vedic scriptures or the nectar transferred by the Lord to his consorts in the, uh, in the conjugal humour from the lotus mouth of Vyasadeva or Sukadeva. By gradual development of transcendental knowledge, one can rise to the stage of the transcendental arts of music and dance displayed by the Lord in his Rasa Lila, but without having the Vedic knowledge, one can hardly understand the transcendental nature of the Lord's Rasa dance and music. The pure devotees of the Lord, however, can equally rel relish the nectar in the form of the profound philosophical discourses and in the form of kissing by the Lord in the rasa dance, as there is no mundane distinction between the two. <laughs> so, very amazing Prabhupada's purport that he compares the discourses to the kissing of the Lord, and he says there's no difference between the two. It is not mundane, it is not sense gratification. When Krishna hugs and kisses the gopis, it is not sense gratification. It is the transcendental pastimes of the Lord. So we should understand these things very carefully, understand the Lord's transcendental position. All right, so then the final verse. My dear King, Brahma, the firstborn, on being questioned by Narada 
exactly apprised him on the subject as it had been directly spoken by the Lord to his own son, who was impregnated with Vedic knowledge from his very birth. So this verse takes us into the next chapter. We'll hear tomorrow how Lord Brahma was approached by Narada with the similar questions which Maharaj Parikshit had put to Sukadeva Goswami. And we will hear how Lord Brahma answered, how he begins to deal, how he replies to uh, Narada's questions. And in this way, he will describe the Vedic knowledge, the process of creation. All right. So, are there any questions? Anyone has any questions? We heard about Sukadeva Goswami being approached by Maharaj Parikshit. Maharaj Parikshit wants to know about creation. He's he wants to hear more topics from Sukadeva Goswami. So he's asked him to speak on the subject matter of Shristi Tattva. And Sukadeva Goswami begins his reply by offering his prayers and describing the transcendental position of the Supreme Lord, how he is above everyone, how he has inconceivable potencies, and how he is impartial. He's be, he's a benediction, he gives benedictions to everyone, but not everyone in the same way. And we heard particularly how he's very merciful to the sinful races, how they can all be delivered by the power of the Lord. We spoke about how devotees should become so pure and so powerful in their preaching that they can also lead the society, that they can set the example for the world. So we hope that gradually these things will happen. We also heard that devotional service needn't take a long time. One can immediately get the benefit and be purified and freed from all sinful reactions. And anyone from any section of the world, this opportunity is there. So on that basis, Srila Prabhupada had devotees. Uh, devotees guiding uh, the world. Yes. So, is there any currently initiative, like you said, Srila Prabhupada tried his best to influence the political uh, uh, leaders. Uh, is there cu currently any initiative like that, that is there in the ISKCON uh, mission? I, I don't know of any, but I know in Prabhupada's time there was one devotee uh, in America. He was the son of a lawyer. He was an, an American, young American man, and he was very good intelligent man and sharp intelligence and he established a party called in god we trust and he preached krishna consciousness and he did take part in the election but when Prabhupada heard about how expensive how much money was required Prabhupada didn't encourage it he said no no we can't spend money like that so they did do it they did try you know he he didn't win the election but it did cre create some stir and got some publicity for our movement. That was in Srila Prabhupada's time, when our movement was still young, when we didn't have many members. But he did a lot of very good preaching, but Prabhupada just wasn't in favour of us spending a lot of money on political campaigning. And that's what it takes in America, political campaign. 
Prabhupada, you can see from Prabhupada's purports, his approach is more that we should preach to the politicians and get them to become devotees. Not necessarily that we ourselves have to become the politicians and lead the world, but we should convince the politicians, the people who are in power, let them do it, but let them become devotees. Let's convince them about the importance of Krishna consciousness. They have the birth, they have the qualifications, they have the training. Just let them have Krishna consciousness. They have the karma for leadership. Just let them become more Krishna conscious. That can be effective. If we try to do it, we'll become ruined. We'll waste all of our time, give up Krishna consciousness. <laughs> wouldn't, be, wouldn't be good for us to try to do it. We should keep our position as devotees, but try to preach to the politicians if we get a chance. If we get to meet some politicians, get to know some important people, then bring them to Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so very much. Okay, then I'll meet you tomorrow then. We'll be continue tomorrow. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada yes, Ki Jai. Jai. Go back to Vishnu.